<clears throat> Here is a review of Pingo and how to use it uh, for classes in psychology. And I use Pingo all the time. I find it really useful. And so at first I'm going to review a little bit about uh, Pingo and the research that's been done behind it, where it comes from and how to use it. Then I'm going to actually do a little tour of Pingo as, as I use it and some of the ways that you can view the data with your students. So first of all, Pingo is peer instruction for very large groups and it was invented at the University of Paderborn and it can be used without any kind of clicker system. It can be used with phones or tablets or laptops and that is both a good and a, and a bad thing. So those students who don't have any of those devices are excluded. But in my personal experience, uh, everybody, it's, it's maybe less than 5% of students don't have some kind of a device to use with Pingo. So almost all my students have some kind of smartphone. And there is a way of getting around this, uh, this problem of students not having these devices, which is uh, doing something called peer instruction. So what you do is you have students get into small groups, and then they can share one device to answer questions. And they can also discuss things amongst themselves, rather than each student replying individually. I'll go through that in just a second. So some great things about Pingo. It was obviously invented by Germans, which means it works beautifully. Questions don't appear on students' screens until they've been initiated by the lecturer. I'll show you how that works in a second. You can share questions and sessions from other users who have made them public. This isn't great right this second because a lot of those questions are in German and they're for a variety of other subjects. But if a critical mass of us use Pingo, it actually might be quite useful for coming up with things for classes. You can organize pre-made questions by sessions or by tags. So I'm going to show you how to use this in a second, but the tags are really useful because the tags are not just kind of one file or folder for questions, but you can put a lot of tags on questions, and that way it makes it much, much easier to find them. So for instance, you could tag questions as review questions. You can tag them as to what unit you use them in, what year you did uh, use them in, uh, whether they're multiple choice or, or text those kinds of things. <clears throat> There's four different question types which offers you some uh, flexibility and you can also see the tour which I'm going to put in the description box underneath this video on YouTube, the official Pingo tour uh, from the University of Paderborn about how to use Pingo. The people at Paderborn have done some uh, research and they think that Pingo really improves student learning uh, much better than a traditional lecture style. Considering that it's very easy to zone out in a two-hour lecture, I do not doubt this at all. And they really say that you should use cooperative activities among students to help learning. So one thing that they say is that you should do some kind of peer instruction, which is where there's this cooperative teaching and learning style. So what they do is you ask the students a question, and then you let them arrange themselves into groups of two or three, and then the students can des decide amongst themselves uh, what is the right answer. One really good thing about this is that for those students who understand the question and know the right answer, they get a chance to explain themselves to other students. By teaching, they end up learning the concept better. And also, when people are teaching each other concepts and they're at a similar level of understanding, they might be able to explain things better to each other than you could explain to them. They might be able to explain you know, better ways of thinking about things. And also, just these kinds of you know, short bursts of social interaction can be really good for keeping students sort of stimulated and engaged. So one way that they suggest uh, to use Pingo is to do sort of a brief introduction to your lecture, which is 10 to 15 minutes. Then you do a multiple choice question and you see how well students are understanding what you said. It's obviously really easy to say, does everybody understand what I'm saying and see a bunch of nods in the audience and think, Everybody understands perfectly, but when you do this multiple choice question, you really seem to get at the heart of things without anybody having to embarrass themselves by raising their hand that they don't understand. So what happens is if you get 30% or less of the correct answer, or, you know, I often have questions that have uh, three or four possible responses. So if the students are only getting the right answer at chance, um, or just slightly above chance, then you can revise what you've already said and talk to them again about what 
what the material was that they may or may not understand. If more of them get the correct answer, then what you can do is let those who understand what's going on explain things to those who are struggling a bit. So you can offer them two or three minutes of peer discussion where those students who get it can talk to those students who don't get it as much and the students can sort of chat it to each other and try to convince each other of uh, what the correct answer is. This really works well for kind of provocative questions um, like I'm going to show you a couple of questions that I asked in the psychology of everyday life that are sort of moral questions and that seemed to get the students really um, chatting to one another. But you can also do this for regular multiple choice kinds of questions. And then if a lot of students get the correct answer, if the majority of them get the correct answer, then you can just have a short discussion about the remaining misconception. So for those few students who got the wrong answer, you can just explain to them, okay, you know, this is the potential misconception that you have, and uh, you can talk to me more about this later if you are still struggling with this particular concept. Two other things uh, is that you can introduce, uh, integrate Pingo with Microsoft PowerPoint on a PC. I don't do this myself because I use a Mac. So how I generally integrate Pingo is I bring my laptop in when I give lectures and then I have my laptop on one screen. So that's the PowerPoint. And then I have the Pingo screen on the rack PC. So on the PC that's actually in the classroom itself. And so what I can do is the students can see the survey responses on one screen and then they can see the question uh, on the other screen. And that works really well for me. There's also a way to use text responses in a way that's similar to like a pub quiz. And then you can get students into small groups and that can be a lot of fun. So I'm going to show you now my own Pingo and how I use it. Uh, just do a quick tour. So first of all, uh, when you log into Pingo, you <clears throat> uh, will log in. Uh, what you'll do here is you will say, let's say I logged out, right? You can log in um, or you can sign up for it. If you were to sign up, this is a very short form that you would fill out. Anyway, I'm just going to log in. And I'm going to show you how to make some different questions. So first of all, uh, these are some of the questions that I have. <clears throat> so you can see here I've, I've made loads and loads of questions. And um, these are all questions, for example, that I used. Uh, I let students rate faces for their project for Introduction to Psych Science. Uh, also, you can ask quite long questions as well. And all of these questions have tags associated with them. So these are all the questions that I've asked for exploring psychology. These are all the questions that I asked in health psychology. These are questions I asked in key ideas. And you can see all of the different uh, tags that I have used here. All right, so what you do first if you want to make a question is that you just go to create question and you can see here that there are four different options of questions that you can create. There's single choice, multiple choice, text, and numeric. Something important to remember is that all the questions are attached to a session. So you actually have to start a session to ask a question. I'll show you how that works in just a second. But if you just go to single choice, you can uh, make a question. So let's say I say, how related are the average full brother and sister, right? And then I wanted to tag this. So uh, I could say this is a question for key ideas. This is a question from 2015. That's good. And I can make this question public if I want to. And now I just add the responses. And then I can also say which one is the correct answer. So you just create the question. And then you can see also how the questions are displayed to the audience. So <clears throat> just go to create the question. And then you can see the question is here. I'm going to go through how to make all the different questions before I show you exactly how I use them when I am giving a lecture. 
Another question that you can make is multiple choice, which is basically the same thing I just showed you, except that you can uh, click on multiple options. The same kind of thing where you can also put the correct answer. You can also create text questions, and I'll show you um, how that looks. So let's say, what is your favorite color? And you can put tags there as well. And then you can say how many options that you can uh, put down. So if you just said everybody can pick a single color, people could pick up to three colors, or any number. So that way people could just keep responding if you wanted them to. And then there's the numeric questions. I never use this because it hasn't really come in handy with, with me, but this is where somebody can enter in a numerical value. And I did try this out of the teaching and learning away day, and one of you put 10,000 when I asked you on a scale of 1 to 10, so it didn't work so well for me. All right, so let me show you how you use a session. So let's say these are all the sessions that I've done. And um, this is one of the questions that I asked in Psychology of Everyday Life, which is a discussed question. So here's the discussed lecture, number 4471. And what I would do is... Go to my sessions. And this is where I would start a question. So let's say I go to start a question from a list, and then I would say, look at the tags for everyday life. And then I would say, um, this ask this question. So a family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They had heard the dog meat was delicious. So what I did in the Psychology of Everyday Life lecture is these are moral questions from Jonathan Haidt. And what I do is I have this slide up on one side where I show them what the link is, 4471. And then this is the survey as it's running on the other side. Now, this is what the question looks like to the students. And they can see the options available here, and they can also see the time that's remaining. And here there's 27 uh, question, uh, seconds left remaining. Now, once the question has been finished, the results are going to come up. And what I'm going to do is go back to the session, and I'm going to show you how the students responded uh, to this particular question. So for the... Um, Discuss lecture. These are the different surveys that I asked them. Um, and this is the family dog question. So here I can view the survey. And there's a couple of different ways that I can show the participants the uh, results. So this is in a table. And oh, this, this is actually the only way you can look at these results, actually. So it shows you um, what percentage of them. And so uh, 75% of people think it's very wrong to eat the family dog if it was killed by a car in front of your house. 20% think it's a little bit wrong, and 5% said this was perfectly okay. And then it was a lot of fun to ask them, you know, why they thought that in particular. Now let me show you how another question can look. So this works really well, and you can uh, see, you know, the numbers. You can see things in this sort of table form as well. Let's say I wanted to look at uh, another question, which is the away day question. So here's the session that I showed to the away day. And you can see that I have this data forever uh, that I got from each of the sessions. And I can view the survey. <coughs> so this is, um, what is are your favorite tutorials from those listed here? And it looks like 16 of you responded. So I can look here, and you can see a graph. But you can also see here the uh, different options. <clears throat> and then I can also download this chart and put it elsewhere if I want to. Another thing that you can do is to 
look at the text-based responses. So I asked you all last time, um, just trying to figure something out here quickly. Hold on. I think there is a way of getting these in the order of greatest to, to least, but I can't seem to figure that out right now. So. I'll have to get back to you on that. OK, so this is a, a question that I asked you all. Name one or two topics or tutorials you'd like to see in the upcoming year. And I can view this survey. And this is what you all said. And there's a couple of ways that I can show students, or in this case, you all, your responses. So this is a sort of a text cloud. And these are what you said. And then I can switch view to a table and see the responses that you all put down. So name one or two topics of tutorials you'd like to see in the upcoming year. Uh, there were different, and then I can actually uh, have these based on the number of occurrences, but these are all one. So Paul's dress sense, being professional, technology behavior, roading English, plagiarism, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so what I would normally do is show the students the responses on one side and then have the lecture on the other side in the lecture theater. Now, um, something important to remember is that the, you can't give students the questions by themselves. They have to be attached to a session. So what you do if you are planning on using questions that you've made is you just start a new session. So I would just do put in a new session and I would say and go <clears throat> demonstration. Okay, and then now I've made this session. I can ask any questions that I've ever asked before. So what you'll do is you see this number here. This is going to be the link that you use to give to students and this is the link that you'll put on your PowerPoints for example if you want to use Pingo. So it's just pingo.upb.de slash 46 or 4262 in this particular case. And now I can, if I tell everybody to navigate to this link, ask any questions that I've ever asked before from the list. So let's say I want to start a question from the list, and I want to ask this, how related are the average full brother and sister? Uh, and then you'll see here, this is the view that I have, where I'm waiting for the, where I'm waiting for the, where I'm waiting for the st uh, students to get back to me. And then this is the other list that I have here, where this is how it looks to the students themselves, right? Where you can vote. And then you can stop the question at any time, and then you can see exactly what the results are. You can use your tags here to uh, whittle down what questions that you want to ask people. And that's basically it. <clears throat> so I hope this has helped you figure out how you might use Pingo into your classes. And if you have any other questions, let me know. Um, I'll also put, put the information from Powderborn itself, their information up uh, under this video.